Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you would please, to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, please. Second Timothy chapter 1, we're going to read verses 3 through 7. We'll begin together on verse number 3, and I'll read verse 4. We'll alternate reading like that till we end together on verse 7 of Second Timothy chapter 1. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse number 3. Ready? I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Lord, we pray that uh, you will continue to make our hearts ready uh, to receive the truth from your word. Lord, we thank you for the good music today and the the blessing the songs have been, not only to sing, but to hear sung. And Lord, we're asking you now that you would use the special uh, to, again, prepare us and make our hearts good ground that the Word of God will fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Where does it all begin? That moment when we understand salvation. Where do we get the idea of who we are and who he is? It begins in... (coughs) And when do we first see him? As more than mystery or imagination, when do we see that he knows us by our first name who shows us? It begins in the heart of a mother praying over her children each night. And it begins with the love of the Father who shows us what the Father is like. For God's children are never too little to know him as Savior and friend. You and I are given the greatest gift in heaven a chance to lead these little ones to him. For this is where it all begins. When does it fall in place? The words we learn by memory each Sunday. When does his word start to spring up? in the children that we bring up. It begins when we live by his grace in the day in and day out of every Monday. And one day when we least expect it, they surprise us and reflect it. It begins in the heart of a mother praying over her children each night. And it begins with the love of a father who shows us what the father is like. For God's children are never too big or too little to know him as Savior and friend. You and I are 
given the greatest gift in heaven, a chance to lead these little ones to him. For this is where it all begins. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer now as we come to the preaching of your word. Lord, I want to thank you today for the Bible, and I'm asking you, Lord, to once again use the word of God in the hearts of people this morning. Lord, I believe the word of God is quick. I believe it's alive. I believe it's powerful. I believe it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and Lord, it can divide asunder between the soul and the spirit, what we want and what we know that you want. Lord, I pray that you would take the truth this morning and we look at this mother and grandmother of Timothy. And Lord, I pray it will be an encouragement and I pray it will be a help to those in attendance here today. Help me as I bring the truth and help the people as they listen. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The, I remember reading in Reader's Digest back around the first of the year about a son who called home and was asking his parents about their New Year's resolutions. Dean, I'm a little raspy today. Give me a little bit more on that if you would. And was asking about their New Year's resolutions. And dad said, well, my resolution for the New Year is to make your mother happy. And uh, he thought, okay, that's interesting. And he got mom on the phone and asked mom, what's your resolution for the New Year? She said, my resolution is to make sure dad keeps his resolution, and, uh, and, and I hope that's working out for him as I think about Mother's Day, amen, but, you know, I, I don't know that um, it, it's, it's always a struggle sometimes for a pastor on, on certain days like Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, different things like that, do, to, do, you, do you preach a message? You know, to just mothers, do you preach a message, just fathers? Do you have to go with that theme at all? Can you just uh, bring a, 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 what, what, whatever a normal message is? I'm not sure I know what one is, but uh, whatever a normal message is. You understand? Yeah, you kind of struggle with that a little bit. And, and, and I understand there's some that, um, you know, motherhood's a real struggle. And uh, it's not something that necessarily they welcomed. Uh, for some, it's not biological po- biologically possible. Uh, for them to become mothers, and it's a real sensitive subject, and it's a difficult day for some. For some, they did not have necessarily a real good mother, and uh, Mother's Day doesn't bring back a lot of good memories for them. And it's a struggle sometimes for them to get through Mother's Day, and they're kind of glad uh, when it's over. And so um, uh, the, there was one fellow who said to become a mother is not so difficult, but to be a mother is very much so. And uh, that's a true statement. So I understand the, the tremendous responsibilities in being a mother and given to a mother. And there's many things that go into being a mother, uh, without a doubt, that, that, that men will never understand. Okay? I do know this. If, if, if God reversed it and it was the men who had to have the children, we would not have any population problem in the world. There'd be a whole lot fewer people in the world, all right? Just, just say it. But there's a message that, that the Lord kept bringing to my mind as I thought about Mother's Day, and it was, it was just about the two women that we read about in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Um, the two, the, the mother and the grandmother of Timothy. And these are uh, two mothers uh, that had a tremendous influence on a boy, growing him up to be a preacher. Growing him up to be a man of God. Growing up a man who Paul would say, I have no one like-minded who will naturally care for your state. I have no one who thinks like I do. And that was Timothy. And, and he was brought to faith and nurtured in the faith by his mother and his grandmother. You know, being raised in a Christian home is a, is a great blessing. Don't take that for granted teenagers and uh, those of you in this room and you're in a Christian home where mom and dad are saved or even if just mom's saved or even if just dad's saved, don't take that for granted. 
It's a great blessing to be in a Christian home, to be instructed in the ways of God. Hey, to just get up every morning, every Sunday, and know we're going to church. That's a great blessing. Don't, I understand, I mean, well, I don't go to, I meet people and they say, I don't go to church because my parents forced me to go when I was younger. And I never let that go. I won't. I, I was forced to go when I was younger and I still go. Every Sunday. In fact, I come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday too. <laughs> don't, don't tell me that, that, that you're forced to go. And, I, and, you know, and, and I'll try to say it with a smile, but I'll, I'll say, now, they force you to do other things and you still do them. I'm sure they force you to brush your teeth occasionally. And, and I'm sure they told you to take a bath or a shower occasionally. And you did that. You see, there's other things we did and we still do them. I say the truth is, you don't come to church because your heart's wicked and you don't want to be in church. And I smile, okay? But I don't let that go. It's a great blessing to be in a Christian home. Now, in Timothy's case, uh, all it says in Acts 16 about his daddy was his daddy was a Greek. It doesn't say anything about him being a Christian. Uh, the fact that it mentions that he was a Greek probably is the fact that he was not a Christian. And, and so, uh, he, all he had at home, he didn't. And, and by the time we get older in life, and he's dealing with the epistle here, which is the last epistle Paul wrote, Second Timothy, no mention of dad is mentioned at all, and dad's probably not even alive. But the dominant influence for Timothy had been his mother and his grandmother. What did they teach him? What did they instill into him to have him turn out the way he did? What, 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 what kind of uh, teaching and what kind of training took place that they would turn out someone who the Apostle Paul would say, I want him. In fact, I'm going to train him to take my place. What a, what a great honor. And what a great privilege. Well, the Bible says here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. Unfeigned means it's true and it's honest. It's undisguised. In other words, they didn't hide their faith. They weren't, they weren't one of those that said, I'll hide it under a bushel. No, they said, I'm going to let it shine. Okay? And uh, they, they, they let it be known. Don't, don't ever underestimate the influence of a godly mother. Don't underestimate the influence you can have on your children as a godly mother. I think they instilled this unfeigned faith, this faith. I think there's five qualities of faith mentioned here in this passage five qualities of faith they gave to Timothy that they passed on, if you will, from one generation to the next generation to the third generation. From grandma to mom to Timothy. And I think first of all, what I mentioned a minute ago, it was sincere faith. A sincere faith. Did you know, do you know that the, the, sometimes on computer commercials, you know, it'll, it'll, or you'll see a computer and it'll say it has an Intel processor inside, you know, and a Pentium, and, and it's all those processors, how fast it can you know, work the information. Did you know the greatest processor that's ever been created is right up here? It's right in your head and mine. I know you think you got left out and God didn't put one in you, but He did. He did. And you have one in your brain. You have one upstairs. And, and Paul is saying, you know, children, listen, not only children, all of us, we record everything we see and hear. It goes in here. And you may not be able to pull it up as fast as you used to or pull it up like you'd like to, but I'll guarantee you it's there. It's in there. It never, you, you, never, you never get the thing that says memory's full. You know, you, uh, download some stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's always room. It's unlimited. It's amazing. And so Paul says, I, 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 I'm recalling your unfeigned or your sincere faith and saying, Timothy, you, you have got this faith that you have from mom and from grandma. 
George Washington said, My mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. All I am I owe to my mother. I attribute my success in life to the moral, intellectual, and spiritual education I received from her. Andrew Jackson said of his mother, There was never a woman like her, gentle as a dove and brave as a lioness. The memory of my mother and her teachings were, after all, the only capital I had to start with in life. And on that capital I have made my way. Abraham Lincoln said, I remember my mother's prayers, and they always followed me. They have clung to me all of my life. Ronald Reagan said, From my mother I learned the value of prayer, how to have dreams and believe that they could come true. Listen, there's a, it's a, it's a real wake-up call here for moms and dads. The children see a genuine, sincere faith in our lives. That it's not a, that, that they don't see us, they don't see us one way when we come to church and a whole nother way when we're at home. And a whole different attitude and a whole different vocabulary depending on who we're around. They, they want to see an authentic faith. They want to see something that's real, that's genuine, that is unfeigned, as the Bible says. And sincerity and sincere faith is always seen very clearly. Mother's Day, we honor mothers, and, and I want to encourage you moms, let your children see your faith. Actions speak louder than words. Let them see your faith in action. And that, 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 is, that, that can simply be in fulfilling your task every day. What they sang about this morning in that song, and, and you know, from, from washing uh, the clothes and ironing the clothes and dishes and vacuuming and just doing the, the household jobs and the household things that a mother would do and doing it joyfully and doing it happily and doing it as if God has given you this opportunity. Don't miss that then that's what your children see. They want to see the sincere faith. I want to ask you something. Paul said here that, he said, I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that's in you. And he says, and it dwelt first in your mother and your grandmother. He says, I'm thinking about you. Let me ask you a question. What will your children think? What will they say when they remember you, when they think about you, and they think about what they've seen as they grow up, when they recall their time with you, what will come to their mind? Is it good? Is it godly? It was sincere faith. Secondly, I want you to see it was a shared faith. It was a shared faith. Again, it started in grandma and then mother and then moved on to Timothy. And so that, uh, that, that faith was passed on to the third generation. And mom and dad, whatever is considered important in our life, gets passed on to our children. If, you're, if your priority uh, in your life uh, is your vocation or your job, chances are that's going to become the top priority in your children's life. If your top priority is, is things and you like to get things and you make a priority that you have a lot of stuff in your life, your children are going to have the same priority. If your priority is attention and you're always liking to get the applause of people and you want to get everyone's approval, your children are going to be that way. That's going to become a priority with them. Whatever it is, it, it, it's, it's transferable to our children. Well, I don't want uh, uh, just, just work or, or pleasure or money or any of those things to get transferred. I want my faith to be transferred to my children. I want my faith in God to be transferred to them. My friend, it's a, it, it's a, it's a real struggle for parents who, are, who have grown children 
It's, it's, it's a burden they carry. Who Hey, listen, it's not a matter of their child's successful or their child makes money or their child has a nice home or their child has all the things that everyone else would look at and say, boy, they got a successful life. If you know they've abandoned their faith, that they're not living for God, they're not, their life isn't counting anything for the Lord Jesus, you feel like as a parent, I missed something somewhere. I didn't, I didn't transfer what I needed to. To those children. Paul said at the beginning. He said I'm calling your remembrance. Unfaith faith. Notice Timothy that is in thee. And then he ends the verse the same way. And I'm persuaded that in thee also. Said It's faith handed down. Passed on. And listen to me this morning now young people. Let me talk to you. There ought to be something in your heart, in your life, that looks at mom and dad and says, I want to have the faith they have. There ought to be something, when I was growing up and I got to be a teenager and God began to work in my heart and, 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 you know, and I heard heard some great preachers growing up and had the privilege of being in a wonderful church and and heard Tom Malone and um, heard... Uh, B.R. Lakin and, and, and heard, just heard some great preachers and you know there was something in me that I just said you know what I just want to be like them I didn't look at my mom and dad and say well, I'm not going to be that kind of a Christian when I get older I said no I want to be exactly that kind of a Christian when I get older I want the faith they have that's the faith I'm going to continue to walk in I'm not looking to go off on my own path somewhere I just want to keep on going in the same path that they walked in I want to take the same faith they had and stay with the same faith. And that's what Timothy did. Timothy said, all right, my grandma had it, and my mom had it, and now I'm going to have it. And I'm not looking for something different. I want the same path that they walked. I want to walk down the same path of faith that they had. You know, we, we hand down a lot of things. Some of you might have things in your home that was handed down from your grandma to your mom to you. And maybe you're looking at one day you'll hand it down to your daughter. Sometimes it's a ring or sometimes it's some heirloom or some, something that's been in your family for generations. And we, we pass things down to others. What, listen, don't overlook passing down your faith. Your faith in God. Sincere faith. It's a sharing faith. You don't, you don't keep it to yourself. Listen, sometimes you meet people and you knock on doors and, and, and sometimes you ask them about their, if they know they're going to heaven or if they, have, they say they have faith or they'll, or they'll tell you that it's a, it's a uh, private matter. That's a private matter between me and God. Can I help you with something? Your faith is not a private matter. Faith is a personal matter, but it's not a private matter. We're to share our faith. And you're absolutely to share it with your children and pass that faith on to another generation. So I believe it was a sincere faith. I believe it was a shared faith. I believe it was a stirred up faith. Notice what the next verse says. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, verse 6, that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Say, Timothy, I'm recalling that faith that was alive in your mom and your grandmother, and I want to convince you, Timothy, stir that up in yourself as well. Stir that up. It's in there. I know it's in there. But you've got to stir it up. You've got to fan the flame a little bit. It, it really has the idea of a fire here, or a charcoal fire, when it, when, when it starts to go down a little bit. And how many of you ever had a charcoal fire or a fire going, and you maybe put in the fireplace, or maybe you had to put a little more wood on it, and then you blew on it? Huh? And pretty soon, it takes flames up. Now, I don't know if that's an indication of your breath or whether you just gave it oxygen, but the, uh, it, it, it flames up. You know what you did? You stirred it up a little bit. And God says, Timothy, fan the flame. Listen, fan the faith. You, you've got it in you. I know you do. I know they've shared it with you. But you've got to stir that up. It requires some action and some effort on your part to stir up the faith that they've passed on to you. To be doer of the word and not just hearers only. If you just let the faith lie in you dormant and never do anything with it, it will die out. It'll become cold. And you'll be doing, you, you will not, you will become like Lot 
and people won't even know that you're a Christian. You'll, 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 be, you'll be perfectly comfortable with folks who don't even know God and don't have anything to do with God. You'll have, and when you try to, if you by some way try to tell somebody about Jesus, they'll laugh at you. That's what they did with Lot. He had no testimony at all. You got to stir up the faith. You have to stir that up that's in you. I think your mom and grandma fanned the flame of Timothy's faith in his heart. Those, the, the gifts that God gives us. And by the way, we don't have faith on our own. God gives us the faith. And it's like muscle. You know, a, a baby has all the muscles they need. They just have to develop them. And when you get saved, God gives you all the gifts you have, but we have to develop them. We have to begin to work them. We have to allow God to work in us and through us that which is pleasing in His sight. And then the gifts that we have and the faith we receive gets developed by us using it. And we begin to get stronger and become healthy men and women of faith. Sometimes when you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fan the flame in my children and I'm going to stir their faith up and I'm going to keep the fire going, sometimes that seems overwhelming at times to a parent. How do I get all that done? I got enough just getting everything, you know, got to get the house clean and, the, you know, the, the, the dishes done and the laundry folded and the, 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 this put away and the, this cleaned up. And, and about the time I finally think I got it all done, it starts over. Or if you have little ones at home, they're coming behind you and undoing everything you did. You say, all right, then well, I'm supposed to teach them the Bible? And I know that's how you feel sometimes. It's overwhelming, but listen... I'm not telling you to do it. Somebody else has told you to do it. And he's not suggesting it. Look with me in the Old Testament for a moment, would you please? We'll come back to 2 Timothy. Look, look back in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. And here's what the Lord told Israel. Let's, let's, let's start in verse number 1. I was going to start up at verse 4. Let's start in verse 1. Because notice what the Lord said. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments with the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and commandments which I command thee. Thou, watch, and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Mom and Dad, let me ask you a question. Do you ever have a time when you stop teaching your sons then and your daughters? No, you're teaching them all the days of your life. I can't wait till you're 18 and get out of here. What is that about? Where's that scripture? Where's that verse in the Bible? I don't think I found that one yet. And by the way, young people, I can't wait till I'm 18 and I don't have to listen to you. That's not in the Bible either. Okay? All right? Just all the days of your life, you're, you're, you're teaching. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the, gate, the posts of thy house and on thy gates. How, how is it that it seems like it's so easy to talk to our children about sports or about 
weather or about their schoolmates or about school or their careers or uh, politics, anything going on in the world. But we kind of freeze up when we talk about spiritual things. We kind of get tongue-tied when we want to tell them about the Lord. Oh, my friend, don't, don't make that critical mistake. Don't have that open dialogue with your children about everything and then get froze up when you talk about the Lord. Talk to them about Christ. Talk to them about faith. Talk to them about the Bible. Have time every day. Listen, I doesn't, well, my husband's not saved. Well, neither was Timothy's. Timothy's daddy was lost. But mama said, I'll teach him the Bible. I'll give him the Word of God. I'll teach him what they need to know. Look back in 2 Timothy with me, would you please? Notice, notice what Paul said to him in chapter 3. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul reminds Timothy, Paul reminds Timothy here in verse 14. He said, Timothy, uh, you continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Hey, who had Timothy learned it from? Yeah, his mom and his grandma. He said, because look at verse 15. That from a... Child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. How did he know the Scriptures from a child? Dad didn't teach him. Mama taught him. Grandma taught him. Teach them the Word of God. The influence of a godly mother and a godly grandmother in the life of Timothy. He owed his faith to them. They made it a priority to have a sincere faith and a shared faith and a stirred up faith. Verse 7 also tells us, go back to chapter 1, 2 Timothy, there was also a very strong faith. Notice with me verse number 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God does not give us the spirit of fear or fearfulness. The faith we have is a strong faith. The faith we have is a bold faith. The child who inherits the kind of faith that's passed on here by Lois and Eunice, you know what? If they're not timid about their faith. It's real to them. It's, 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 it's alive in them. When I live and I'm alive and I really believe something and I'm really convinced of something, you know what? It affects everything I do. It affects your behavior. It'll affect your, the way you walk. It'll affect the way you talk. It'll affect everything you do. God has given us power, love, and a sound mind. Power is the ability to impact others. The love is the ability to empathize with others. And the sound mind is the ability to discern and know what to do. People who, who listen, people who have faith, when you instill faith in your children, they're not driven. They're not, they're, 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 the decisions they make aren't driven by what other people are going to think. They're not driven by what's popular with everybody else. They're going to be driven by what does God want? What does God want me to do? They're not self-centered. They're God-centered. And they'll have the strength to stand. When I think of this, I think of Daniel, who as a teenager was taken into captivity in the land of Babylon. Hundreds of miles from home. And not only just him, but hundreds, possibly thousands of other young men his age. And they're all taken into captivity into Babylon. And you know the story. The king wants to change their names, and he's changing their education, he's changing their diet. And Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's drink and the king's meat. Let me ask you a question. He's probably anywhere from 14 to 17 years of age when he goes into captivity. 
Where'd he learn that? Yeah, he had to learn it from home. He had to learn it from dad and mom. He didn't say, hey, everybody else is doing it. Hmm? How, many, uh, how many ever tried that on your mom and dad? Everybody else is doing it. Huh? How many ever tried that? How many ever made it? How many ever, how many, how many, uh, did it ever work with your mom and dad? Did, was there ever a mom and dad who said, oh, well, if everybody's doing it, who am I to not let my son or daughter do it? No, usually you get something like, well, if everybody's jumping off a cliff, are you going to go jump off the cliff? My dad would simply say, well, I'm not everybody else's dad, but I'm your dad. And uh, he laid down the law. You see, Daniel's name means God is my judge. Daniel knew God was watching. Daniel kept his faith in God because he knew he was accountable to God. Mom and dad, instill in your children, God is watching. Can your children, hey, can they fool you? Yeah. Can they get by with something on you? Yes. I know, you don't want them to know that. And God, God will see to it they find out. Listen to me, kids. God will see to it they find out. Because you can't get one by on God. But God is always watching. Mom and dad are, you know, Captain Penny used to say, you fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool mom. Well, I fooled mom a few times. But you can't fool God. You can't fool God. Second Chronicles 16, 9, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. He's, he's looking around for people to, he says, I'm looking for people whose hearts are perfect towards me, people who want to live by faith. You know what? I'm looking for some people I can show myself strong for. Isn't that amazing? He says, I'm going through the whole earth and I'm just looking for people that I can show myself strong for. Whose hearts are perfect towards me. And I contend with you, those are men and women of faith. The sad thing was when judgment was coming on Israel in the book of Ezekiel, God said this to Ezekiel, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. God says, I'm just looking for a man that would stand in the gap, a man that would believe me, a man that would be a man of faith and conviction, and I just looked for a man. And I couldn't find one to stand in the gap. I don't know if God would look at that way at America and say, I just would like to find a man that will stand in the gap. I wonder if he'll find one. Men and women of faith and conviction, strong faith. God desires we have a strong faith in Him. Sincere faith, a shared faith, a stirred up faith, a strong faith, and lastly, we know it was a saving faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith. It's really the, that's really the first step every parent, that's the first responsibility every parent has. The first responsibility you have to that little child is that they know Jesus as their Savior. That they come to know Christ that they come to know that Christ died for them. and They need to receive Him as their Savior. We had our first daughter, or our only daughter. <laughs> I always tell Amy she's my favorite daughter. She goes, come on, Dad, I'm your only daughter. But uh, she was born at Bob Jones University in South Carolina and was in college there at the time. And when she was born, had, she was only, it was Barge Hospital on campus. And this was a big deal. This isn't a place where they had a lot of births or anything like that. And so she was the only baby in there. And I had a bunch of my friends, and they were all come up with their New Testaments or their Bibles out. And they would all, Brother Lindemann, start preaching to Amy. She's only a few hours old. But they, they couldn't understand how she'd be four hours old and not saved yet. What's wrong with her? 
They were preaching, giving the, you know, they actually, they actually had to say they weren't allowed to come visit. They were causing too much of a problem. But uh, we, we, we laugh at that. But the truth is, your children ought to come to know them as early as they can. I've never, I've never met anybody who's been saved who said, I wish I'd have waited. I wish I would have. I've met many, many who said, I wish I wouldn't have waited so long. I wish I would have known earlier. Uh, people who get saved when they're 20 and 25 and 30 uh, years of age will always tell you, I wish I'd have got saved when I was younger. I wish I'd have knew the Lord. I wasted so many years without Him. Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, you ought to make sure your children or your grandchildren are saved. You ought to make sure they have saving faith. Let me, let me share this with you. Mothers are people too. And you know, sometimes mothers need forgiveness as well. I just feel impressed I should talk about this. Mothers often know that they have some things to change in their lives as well. Mothers aren't perfect. Parents aren't perfect. The Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It doesn't say, obey your parents in the Lord, for they are right. Because we're not always right. It's right to obey. But sometimes parents make mistakes too. One, one column I used to read in a newspaper. A newspaper is a paper that has print on it. Some of you don't even know what a newspaper is, I don't think. They used to deliver it to your house. And you could take it in your living room and read it. The, one of the columns I remember reading, this was, this was 40 years ago, was a woman named Irma Bombeck. You familiar with some of you folks will be familiar with that name. She wrote how the actions of her three-year-old child changed her life forever. Listen carefully to what she wrote. We'll be done. She said, The first four or five years after I had children, I considered motherhood a temporary condition, not a calling. It was a time of my life set aside for exhaustion and long hours. It would pass. She said, Then one afternoon with three kids in tow, I came out of a supermarket pushing a cart with all four wheels that went in the opposite direction. When my toddler son got away from me, just outside the door, he ran toward a machine holding bubble gum in a glass dome. In a voice that shattered glass, he shouted, Give me, give me. I told him I would give him what for if he didn't stop shouting and get into the car. As I physically tried to pry his body from around the bubble gum machine, he pulled the entire thing over. Glass and balls of bubble gum went all over the parking lot. We had now attracted a sizable crowd. <laughs> I told him he would never see a cartoon as long as he lived, and that if he didn't control his temper, he would be making license plates for the state. <laughs> he tried to stifle his sobs as he looked around at the staring crowd. Then he did something I was to remember for the rest of my life. In his helpless quest for comfort, he turned to the only one he trusted his emotions with, me. He threw his arms around my knees and he held on for dear life. I had humiliated him, chastised him, and berated him, but I was still all that he had. That single incident defined my role. I was a major force in this child's life. In that moment, Irma Bombeck realized she'd come up short as a mother. She had humiliated and chastised her son in front of a crowd of people, and she was ashamed that she had done that. But in that moment, her child did something that changed her life forever. He clung to her and showed her that he loved her. 
You know something? That's what God wants for you and me. He wants us to know that He loves us. Oh, He doesn't humiliate us. And He doesn't shame us. He loves us. In fact, He loves us so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. And listen, if you'll receive what Christ has done for you in dying on the cross and paying for your sins, and you'll receive Him as your Savior, God will give you the gift of eternal life. How do you get that? By faith. Faith is just, you just believe God. You trust that God loved you, that He sent His Son to die in your place on the cross, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day, and if you by faith will trust Jesus Christ, He'll forgive your sin. He'll give you the gift of eternal life, and He'll take you to heaven one day. Saving faith. Lois and Eunice. Hope you never forget them. Great, great women. They shared their faith. They were sincere in their faith. They stirred up his faith. They had a strong faith. And it was a saving faith. Let's pray together. Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the attention of everyone today. Thank you for Lois and Eunice. What a couple of great ladies. I look forward to meeting them one day. Lord, we know Timothy and we read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and we know the things the Apostle Paul said about him. A great man. But there'd never been a Timothy if there wasn't a Lois and a Eunice. And Lord, I pray that you'd speak to the hearts of mothers here this morning of the tremendous influence, the tremendous force they are in the lives of their children whether the children are still home or whether they are grown. And I pray, Lord, we would be a godly force and a godly influence. And Father, I'm praying that you'll speak to the hearts of many in this room this morning, that we'll pass our faith on to our children. We'll have sincere faith and a shared faith and a stirred up faith, a strong faith. But Lord, they'll embrace not only to the saving of their soul, but to where they'll want to pass it on to their children. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. But right now, just between you and God, I wonder how many folks in the room would say, Pastor, I, I have a saving faith. I know that there's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner. And I knew I needed to be saved and I found out Jesus was the Savior I needed. That He died for me and I put my faith and trust in Jesus as my Savior. Pastor, I know if I died this morning, I'd go to heaven. I'm sure that I'm saved. I have saving faith. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? Pastor, I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. Are you here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know. If I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't have any idea. I, I'd want to. I'd like to, but I don't have any assurance that if I took my last breath now, my next one would be in heaven. I don't know what you mean really by saving faith. Would you let me pray for you? Not embarrass you. I'll not call you out, but I would like to pray for you. And you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven, but I appreciate you praying for me. Would you slip your hand up right now and put it back down, and I'll pray for you. God bless you. Is there others? Say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me this morning. You couldn't raise your hand the first time, but you raise it now. wonder how many believers here this morning. They say, Pastor, God has spoken to me this morning. How many mothers would say, God has spoken to me, Pastor. I see the importance of passing my faith on to my children. I see what a, what a force that I really have and I am in their life. And I want to pass a sincere faith, a strong faith, on to my children. I wonder how many moms would say, Pastor, God spoke to my heart this morning. Pray for me today. Would you slip it up, Mom? Amen. Amen. Mom, Grandma. Yeah, that's good. You may put them down. I wonder how many young people here today 
young men, young women would say, Pastor, I, I haven't been thankful for Christian parents like I ought to be. You have a godly mom or a godly dad. You have a Christian home. You haven't been thanking God for it. You haven't been honoring your mother and father like God says you should. You need to embrace their faith and you know it. You know what they believe is true. And it's time for you to embrace it as your own. I wonder how many young people today would say, Preacher, pray for me today. God spoke to my heart. Would you slip your hand up? Pray for me. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Back here. Thank you. Over here. Thank you, fellas. Amen. In a moment, I'll pray. We'll have our invitation. The Lord has spoken to your heart. I want you to respond to him. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, while others are coming to pray, just slip from your seat into the nearest aisle. Come down. We'll have people who have been trained. They'll take a Bible. They'll show you how you can know Christ as your Savior this morning. Christian, the altar's open for you to come and bow the knee. Moms, sons, daughters, dads, ask God to help you pass your faith on to your children. Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful truth today from your word. These two wonderful mother and grandmother that passed on their faith to Timothy. Thank you for speaking to hearts through their life yet again this morning. I pray now your will will be done in this invitation. Help each individual to do what you're telling them to do in their heart. May no one resist you in these next few moments. But may your will be done. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. As he sings the invitation song, God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning, will you please? are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior And life more abundant and free Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in His wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us sin no more hath dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace his word shall not fail you he promised believe him and all will be then go to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace.
All right, be seated for a minute if you would, would you please? And uh, remember this evening, six o'clock, Mexico missions trip. If you're gonna go on that trip, would like to go, uh, meet me in the conference room right at six o'clock. Should just take about 10 minutes or so to get everything set and uh, everybody on the same page with that. Ushers, you have books with a coupon inside of it, okay? How many mothers are here this morning? You're a mother, let me put your hand in the air. I'm gonna count right here, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, okay, I think we're okay. But your mothers only, I want you to get, there's a little coupon in there for a free coffee at Turkey Hill, okay? So I want the mothers to get those. I have 31 of them and I think we have enough for that. If you don't drink coffee, don't take one, okay? Then I will, we'll give you just one without the coupon in it, okay? All right, so go ahead and guys pass them out. Uh, ladies who are mothers, put your hand in the air, and they'll give you one. If you're a coffee-drinking mother, put it in the air, and they'll give you that. Got it? Get it to them before the blood runs out of their arm, guys. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Ladies, can you look at it and listen at the same time? May, what's today? 14th? May 27th, Saturday, is Amber Cato's wedding shower. They sent an a announcement for me to announce it to the whole church. That's what this is. This is the announcement to the whole church, okay? All right. So you're, you know what, Kathy, what time is it? I don't have that. Saturday, it's Memorial Day weekend, Saturday the 27th. It's in the afternoon, I'm sure. I just don't know the exact time. I'll have that by tonight. But you need to make that note of that, please, okay? They're coming, and uh, once you be there, they... It's better, she said it's better for any gifts to try to be gift cards, okay, uh, rather than gifts, because I'm not sure what their plans are. Uh, if they're heading on deputation for the mission field as well or not, I don't know. But uh, the note that Mom Cato sent was it's just better for gift cards than uh, gifts, okay? If that will help you uh, in planning for that, I know that they're excited about it. And uh, she, they both, her and her fiance just graduated from Heartland Baptist Bible College and now uh, they're coming here and then they head right out, I think later that night or the next day, they're heading right back to Oklahoma, I think to get married the next week. I think it's pretty quick. So uh, good things, okay? Yes. Oklahoma. Aren't they? Oh. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll get the time and, you know, what, what kind of things they'd like to have. I guess they do that now. When we, when we got married, you took whatever they gave you. <laughs> How many were like that, huh? Now they give you a list, say, here's what you'll give us. And I, okay. That's how they do it. Not saying I like it, but that's how they do it. All right. Let's stand together, shall we? Everybody get the book? Everyone want one? Now, ladies who didn't get one, did anybody not get one want one? We have, did you give them all out, guys? You have some in there? Okay. If you didn't get one and you like one, we'll give it to you, okay? It's just a little one-minute devotional things, just little thoughts, and I think it'll be a blessing to you, okay? All right. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for a good service today. Thank you for decisions that have been made for you. Thank you for mothers. Pray, Lord, that you'll be with those who, whose mothers are with you. And, Lord, they uh, don't have their mother with them today physically. But, Lord, they're rejoicing that they have a mom in heaven with the Lord Jesus. And I pray you strengthen them today. And, Lord, let them be a blessing to others today. We love you. Lord, we pray you'll give us a good afternoon. And bring us back tonight for the evening services in Jesus' name.
Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight.